اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاۃ والسلام علی سید الانبیاء والمرسلین I welcome you all to this study circle on a very important book called Talimat which is translated in English as the education by Maulana Sayyid Abdul Allah Maududi rahmatullah alayhi Before we begin just a couple of housekeeping rules inshallah one it is requested that if we could all keep our cameras switched off and secondly it's recommended that our mics should be turned off as well uh, if you want to speak you can unmute yourself otherwise it's recommended to keep it on mute just to avoid any uh, disturbance or noise in the kitchen i won't take too much time to introduce myself um, because we are short of time today the, we are going to cover the whole book just very briefly it's key messages key themes we are going to cover but still will be short on time so i won't spend much time in introducing myself but i would recommend that if any brothers and sisters wish to benefit from some of our previous presentations or some of the books or articles that we have written you can visit this um, this website at the bottom that's my academia profile and over there inshallah you can see some of the works that i have uh, written and also some of my education qualifications on um i'm sharing this in the spirit that inshallah it would become a sadqa jariya for me if anyone utilizes any works that we have produced it would be a sadqa jariya for myself as well as for the organization inshallah okay so inshallah we can now view the overview of the session what we are going to do today so today it would mainly be two parts in this study circle initially in the first part which comprises of approximately 60 minutes we will do a book review and uh, inshallah we will explain the key themes from the book and then inshallah we will have some time for the question and answers and i'll try to go uh, quickly through some of the things in the book so that we can have more time for discussion and question and answer inshallah let's now discuss some preliminary matters uh and in the meanwhile if you have got any question please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the question it would be very important that we keep it interactive if only i speak then it's very probable that most of us would be asleep very soon so please feel free to share things feel free to ask questions please feel free to add anything to what we are discussing um so you are most welcome inshallah so some of the preliminary matters in that regard one of the things to note is that this book that we are going to discuss today very important book it comprises of nine different chapters which are various speeches or various um writings that molana madudi uh, wrote and they are compiled into a book all the writings and speeches related to education have been compiled in the book and they have formed it in nine chapters now as those speeches were given at different timings different places to different audiences there is there are some things in the book that are repeated as well it's good for the readers that they can refresh their memory and the concepts again as they move from chapter to chapter but for the sake of this presentation what we have done is that we have extracted the key themes from the book and we will be focusing on those themes we won't be going chapter by chapter rather we will be going theme by theme we have uh, organized the main themes of the book in six sections of this presentation in addition to what we have got in the book i have also added a, a few ideas here and there regarding what we can do over here so just a disclaimer that in addition to the book there are some of my own ideas in this presentation as well synthesizing on what we learned from the book and then a very important note that this session is not a replacement for reading the book when you read the book there's a lot of beautiful things in that which we won't be able to cover in today's session because it's just one hour duration i re- highly recommend everyone to read this book anyone interested in the field of education anyone teaching others teaching their own children teaching other children or teaching adults or even trying to uh, bring any improvement in the field of education then it's a must read this book a very important book Okay now how can you benefit from this session so a few things that you need to keep in mind before we start one of the things is that if it would be only beneficial to those people 
for whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the center of their effort. If you are not convinced that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be the center of what we do, it should, he should be the center of our lives, he should be the center of all the systems of, and box of life, then these things might not make much sense to any such person. But if you are convinced that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should be the center of whatever we do, then inshallah all these things you would find very meaningful. Inshallah. Second thing is that you can look at this material from a variety of perspectives. When we are discussing things and presenting some concepts, it is natural that in some people's mind, you will be thinking about adult education, higher education. Some people would be thinking about children education. Some people would be thinking about out of school education. So it's natural. But in order to gain most benefit from this, I would highly recommend to look at it from multiple perspectives, not lock yourself in one perspective, but look at it from multiple perspectives. Third thing is that sometime it can happen, then we get into a syndrome called not my problem. I, I'm, I don't face this problem. It's other people's problem. So we should be mindful of that. All these problems are our problem. Let me give you an example. If something happens in your house, to your son, to your daughter, to your spouse, you consider it as your problem. You try to solve it because it's your house. This ummah, you should love in the same manner too. If anything is wrong anywhere, anywhere on the globe, anywhere on the map, to any of our members of our brethren, it's our problem. We should face, we should feel pain for that. So with this objective, you should see this content. For some of those, those things, you might say that it doesn't happen in our country, but whichever Muslim country or Muslim land it is happening, it's, in it, it's our problem. It's a matter of pain for us. So we have to be mindful of that. Last but not the least in this regard, I would like to say that we should demolish any perceptions of impossible. Sometimes we have a preconceived notions that this thing is not possible. This is impossible. If we look at something with this mindset, we would never be able to practically implement it. So very important to go with the can-do attitude and the attitude of possibility and not impossibility. With this introduction and um, basic overview, let's now start with section number one. As we discussed, our presentation is divided in six sections. First section, why do we need a revolution in education? Why is it important? Why should we do something about it? Let's see what does Maulana Mahdudi say about it. In the book, Maulana has presented two tier approach. One is defensive and the other one involves marching ahead. When it comes to the defensive side, he has explained the phenomena of why nations perish. Nations do not perish because they stop reproducing. They also do not perish because they were killed and all of them were killed and no one was left. They do not perish because of these things. Just think, why do nations perish? What comes to your mind? Nations perish when they leave their civilization. Whatever makes them distinct, whatever is their identity, when they leave that, they perish. We still have got offsprings of the Kiptis of, and, and also the offsprings of Pharaoh, but no one knows them with this identity because they merge themselves into another identity. So nations take different identities and then they die. So that is why it's very important that through our educational system, we should preserve the identity of our nation, the civilization of our nation. And then inshallah, we will stay till the day of judgment. We will not perish if we preserve our identity. And it is also possible that we won't perish as a whole, but pockets of our ummah might perish. To preserve those uh, pockets of our ummah from perishing, it's very important that we preserve our identity through education. So that's the defensive side of things. But when it comes to marching ahead, you now have to think, why do nations do great things in life? You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the imama, imamat of the world to various nations. Why, do, why does it happen? Why it was previously in the hands of Arabs and then it went away from them? 
Why before that they were Romans, they were Persians, these powers? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give power to them? Why do they lead the world? What is the factor? So Malana Madhudi has analyzed all the factors that, read, that lead to the rise and fall of nations. And he has identified that Quran has explained it in three terms, which you can see on your screen. Sama, listening, Basr, watch, and Fuad, which is to think, with reference to the heart. So these are the three things. And he has explained that Sama does not only refer to listening. It means accumulating all the information that exists prior to you, that already existed gathering that knowledge, learning. Many of us do that. We go to institutes, colleges, universities and gain what is already identified by people, what is already found out. Basur is for observation, finding new information. That's Basur. And that's where we are lacking significantly at the moment. And Fuad is finding theories, linking things, finding wisdom out of things. That's Fuad. So the nations that lead the world excel in these three things. They gather the knowledge that was available before them. They produce new knowledge. And on the basis of that new knowledge, they bring, come up with theories. They come up with different ideologies. That's how they, they grow in the world and how they get the imama of the world. This imama, even if the people with the bad intention, even if the non-righteous people do these things, they get the leadership of the world. So this, it means that this is what we need to do. And it is exactly what we did. This is what we did in the, in the past as well, when we got to our golden age. Um, I might excuse myself for just a second for a quick call. Okay, so this is exactly what we did when we had our golden age. What we did was that we gathered all the information that was available in pockets. There was, there was information available in India. There was information available with the Greeks. There was information available, available with the Persians, which no other people had because of the language barrier. So Muslims translated all of it into Arabic. Then they became the custodian of knowledge of, of around the world. And based on that, they did the basur. They did more research on that. They experimented. They invented camera. They invented algebra. They invented alchemia. They in invented a number of uh, things in physics, identified the principles of nature in that regard. One of our scientists was sitting under a mountain and he saw his shade. And he moved away and he saw that the shade changed. Based on that, while sitting on sand, he calculated the circumference of the earth. So these were our aslaf, these were our elders. So Sama, Basur, Fuad. Nations lead because of this. And nations get taken the imama away from them because of these. So when we leave, left these things, imamat was taken away from us. Imamat of the world, the leadership of the world. At the moment, what do we do? We, we are not doing good in any of these things. The best we do sometimes is Sama, gathering the knowledge what is already out there. We go and try to gain that knowledge which people have already given us. But no observation, no uh, formulation of the theories and ideologies. So that's why we are not leading the world at the moment. So what does Imamat mean? Imamat means that you are leading the world. You are in the driving seat. When someone is the driving seat, that person or that group or that nation can drive others wherever they want and others follow their cultures. This is exactly what is happening at the moment. This age at the moment is the age of domination of West. And that's why everywhere it's the domination of Western culture. People feel proud to associate themselves with that. And those whose values, whose beliefs, whose practices don't align with those, they are considered as strangers. People think that there's something wrong with these people. Why do they do it like that? 
So they are considered as strangers. And the painful point is that if you are not in the driving seat, then inevitably you are a passenger. You are moving in the same direction. Whatever you do, whatever effort you make, you are flowing in the same direction. Marana Madhudi gave an example in the book. He said that everyone is flowing in that direction. Some are flowing with their head while the others are protesting. They are still flowing, but flowing with their feet. But the matter of the fact is that everyone is flowing in that direction. So this is what we need to really reflect upon. What, why is that and what can we do to avoid that? Why avoid being driven rather than have our own say? Another example he gave in the book is of driver versus the brake. So as we are not coming up with, uh, we are not the thought leaders, what we are doing is the maximum we can do is we are applying some brakes the vehicle that is going in the wrong direction, we are unable to drive that, but we are doing is maximum applying some brakes. Now compare it, the status of being a brake versus status of being the driver. Which one do we like? Which one should we be in? We should be the one who should have the imama of the book. But it is because of our mistakes that we don't have that at the moment. Through our educational system, we can mend those mistakes. And that's what Maulana Madhudi considers, uh, considers as the key objective and vision of the educational system, to gain the imama of the world, leadership of the world. Why is this set as a vision? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about the mission of the Prophet And after the departure of the Prophet, this mission is upon us, as this is one of the rights of the Prophet, that we do his nusra. So what was his mission? He is the one who sent the messenger with the guidance and deen. What is deen? Deen is a complete way of life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Prophet with the complete way of life, which is al-haq, which is the true one. Why? So that he makes it dominant over all other ways of life to be in the driving seat, to get the imama of the world. Even if it is of, uh, of dislike to the mushrikun. So that's why it's very important to be in the seat of Imam. Now think for a minute. What would we get to what would we get or what would we achieve by getting onto that driving seat? Why are we so fussed about it? Why do we care about it? The answer for that is that as we have to make our deen dominant over all deans, that driving would enable us to do that we would be able to steer the direction in the right way. We'll be able to take people to their right destination. The destination where there is happiness, the glory, and not the destination where there's a painful end. So we have to be on the driving seat in that regard. And also we will, be, we will not be considered as strangers when we are in the driving seat. Our culture would dominate in the world as it used to do in the past. People used to come from all over the world to Muslim land and study here because we had centers of excellence. They used to aspire. You can still find the Arabic words in various European languages. You can see still the remains of Arabic architecture, the Muslim architecture in other architectures of the world. Just because of us, the legal system, I was listening to a scholar the other day, the legal system of the West, it's formed on true principles which they borrowed from Muslim Spain. So there's a book you can, which you can read sometime. What does the world owe to the Muslims? And also, what would the world have missed had the Muslim civilization was not there? I might be mixing the name up a little bit, but that's approximately the meaning of uh, the title of that book. So this is what we gave to the world because you were in the driving seat. And now we are not. And we can again be back into the driving seat. We are approximately every fourth person in the world is a Muslim. It's not difficult for us to get into the driving seat if we follow some basic principles. I, th I had thought that I wouldn't share any personal stories in this session because um, the time is really short, but I'm inclined to share this one. Um, when I used to be in Saudi Arabia, there used to be some very hot weather over there, very hot weather. And there were some cars that were imported from America. And in America, we know that the weather is cold. So once I took my vehicle to a mechanic, 
and mechanic got under the car and he said to me that sir something is uh, cut off in the at the bottom there is a piece of equipment which someone has cut off maybe that's degrading the performance of your car let me fix it and i'll charge 400 riyals for that i said okay it's a bit expensive but if you think it's important let's do it so he got it under the car he fixed that thing up and took my money and then when i went off short while after my engine got burst and then i came to know the thing he fixed was deliberately cut because that thing was designed for cold weather it was to warm up the engine so that the engine doesn't freeze and keeps working so it was to warm up the engine and in the hot weather when he added that additional warming factor the engine got burst why did i share this story i shared this story to explain the importance of relevance of the thing a thing is suitable in the place where it is designed for for which it is designed if a system is not designed for a place then it's not suitable if a system is not designed to attain certain objectives then that system is not suitable now just think for a minute the educational system that we live in is the core objective of it to promote islamic values is that why it exists is its objective to make sure that li yuzira al-din kulli happen is that the objective of the system or its objective is otherwise especially when we talk about muslim lands when we were under the colonial era they established various institutions over there what was the core objective of them to prepare those who can sell their own country who can run the their country on behalf of the colonizer that was the aim that was why the edu- that is how the education system was designed so we ought to change that if we want to achieve our desired objective of gaining the imam of the world the educational system has to be designed according to that that's one of the very important things with this we conclude our section 1 we now move on to our section 2 and this section 2 is about identifying the problems in section 1 we have seen some broad aspects of why there should be a revolution in change why we should do something about it now in this section 2 we will try to recognize the disease what exactly is the disease and how we have been trying to treat it in the past and the remedies that haven't worked what are those remedies so in this based on what morana has explained in the book we'll try to understand the disease one of the main problems that we have is the bifurcation of knowledge knowledge in our society in our minds in in mind of ev- almost every one of us is divided into deeni uloom and duniyavi uloom the religious sciences and worldly sciences so we have bifurcated them and that's the main problem Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent Islam as a deen. Deen is a way of life, as we as we learn from the Quran. This term is used to refer to the way of life, the deen of Firaun as well, the law of the Firaun, the the overall system of life, and multiple other places in the Quran. Morana Madudi has written a book on that, the four key terms in the Quran, and one of the terms is deen, in which he has explained that deen. is not just some belief some rituals and uh, and and some uh, acts of worship it's a complete socio political economic system in addition to the aspects of the religion which is beliefs rituals and worship so it's a complete system of life so if it is a complete system of life shouldn't it be taught in every sphere of the life why are we teaching why are we saying that sociology is a worldly subject and not a religious subject why do we say that political science is a worldly subject not a not a, not an islamic subject why are we saying that economics is a worldly subject not an islamic subject why do we say that medical science is a worldly subject and not an islamic subject so because of this bifurcation what we have done we have in our books if you read the books if you read the curriculum you wouldn't find that it's linked to our religion so what message does it give to the student even if we don't say it the student would get the message that when it comes to economics when it comes to political science when it comes to medicine engineering and so on and so forth it is okay to be not muslim it's okay not to worry about what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says 
the book we didn't find any anything about it so we shouldn't be worrying about that but when it comes the islamic studies subject then we will worry about what allah says what does it tell you it is making dual personalities so that is one of the biggest problems that we see in the society people have dual personalities when it comes to taking interest when it comes to doing other wrong things other haram things we leave islam behind but in some act some things we we hold hold it again so that dual personality is because of this thing we haven't islamized our curriculum in economics we don't find allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in politics we don't find in the, in the books of politics we don't find allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is our main problem which is creating hypocrisy and dual personalities in our societies whether it's in in, in the muslim majority countries or in the muslim minority countries so we have to do something about this disease that's a disease the second disease that we have is that we have two mismatched educational system and this is applicable in muslim majority countries as well as muslim minority countries so molana madudi has explained it with an example so there was a storm in the sea and everything was doom and gloom so in that some people thought that we used to have an old ship so they repaired the old ship and got on got onto that to protect themselves the other people thought that the other ship is too old let's borrow a new ship so they bought a new ship and they took people on that now both these ships were fine for that particular period of time when there was um, that thing happening in the sea when there was a storm in the sea but now later on we have to ponder about the permanent solution what should be the right educational system for us let me explain what is meant by this old ship and the new ship the old ship refers to our old system of education which is not that old though because the one that we had initially was one of the best systems in in our early system the initial system people used to go to scholar and learn from them they were not worried about one field of specialization they were polymaths a scholar is writing tafsir in the day and then gazing the night sky and identifying various astronomical phenomena that night similarly a scholar is writing hadith at the same time he's studying chemistry so there was no bifurcation of sciences so they used to study everything so those were the polymaths and also the way of the initial scholars were was that scholar, people used to come to scholars irrespective of their age nowadays just like the industrial processes we see the kids of the same age in the classes that was never an islamic phenomena in islamic phenomena people used to interact with people of different ages and learn from them our children are now because of the system forced to not mature early they do not mature timely because they just interact with the people who have got the same experiences as them they do not interact with people who have got higher experiences and the people who have got higher experiences they sit in their houses on their mobile and they are busy in their own life and not developing the young generation that's a problem with me that's a problem with all of us so that was our early system which was a good system but then later on in order to develop the statesmen the statesmen the people for the government jobs a system was created which was known as darsinizami that system was mainly focused on fiqh because you know because the law of the land was sharia at that time so they had to understand the law of the land also it had mantiq and so on and so forth and philosophy so that their thinking could be enhanced so that was a system that was the old ship and that old ship received various patches throughout history initially there was almost nothing about hadith in that uh, that ship then um, some of the great scholars of the past they came and added the hadith curriculum but that was in the last year at the end of all the studies so and 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 that really goes like at a, at a lightning speed because all the other years have been all the other 8 years have been filled with um, fake and other aspects so hadith comes at the last quran it's it's not covered in a lot of detail not covered in a comparative manner and so on and so forth so having said that so that's an old system which was created 250 to 300 years ago for a different purpose 
but nowadays we consider it to be a religious system. So that requires overhaul in itself. Leaving a few exception and some great institution, there is a need for to um, enhance that system for the needs of the present era. Many of the problems of the present era, many of the graduates uh, of these institutions are unable to solve because they are never taught those things. So exceptions are those scholars who study at their own for a number of years and then develop that skill. Or those who have already graduated in some other discipline, then they go to study and they become great scholars or those who have got other life experiences. But the curriculum itself is not setting people up for success. So these are the scholars who have got religious background, but they don't have the ability to solve the problems of today's age. On the flip side, we have got institutions which talk, teach about all the modern concepts. So they've got information about all the modern things and theories and subjects and so on, but they are deprived of religion. They have no sound, um, sound roots into the religion, no sound understanding of the religion. So what's happening? A bifurcation in the society. There's a group that is called Malvi or the, the people who are considered as low in their status. And um, so these are the religious people because they are unable to cope up with the um, modern realities. And there are others who have no understanding of the religion and they're steering their ship, the new ship in the wrong direction. So these are the two different systems that we have in the society. In our religious education, it's mainly the Sama, mainly enhancing, uh, mainly uh, studying what is already being told and taught for a number of years. And some of the books taught in there are centuries old, centuries old. So no Basar and no Fuad. As we discussed, inability to solve the present problem. And sometimes people think that we should reform this system. And on the same ship, they hang some lights for an Amadudi explains. And they think that this, the, the, the ship has become new, which is not the case. Sometimes we hang the light, sometimes we bring some vessel so that people think that there's a good engine fixed in that. So these are the reforms. For example, you some, sometimes you would think that we need to teach English in Madaris, for example, and so on and so forth. So trying to do overhauls in bits and pieces. All right, when we look at this new ship, it's moving in the wrong direction. These are the professionals which are not rooted in Islam. But sometimes it happens that they do not want to take the blame that they made the people non-Muslims, they made the people atheists. So what they do is that on this new ship, which is going in the opposite direction, they put a sailcloth from the old ship so that they can tell people that we also have got some remains of the old system. And that is some Islamic study subject that they teach along with these different cloths. Is that good enough? That's exactly the problem in our schools. We teach all these things which are compiled from the godless perspective. And with that, we attach a couple of subjects about Islam, a couple of subjects about Islamic study. What is the impact of that? Is that helpful? The same problem used to exist in a university called Aligarh, which Maulana Madhudi has um, explain in his book and answer the problem over there. So we'll go through that shortly, but keep this in mind. Is this patchwork useful for us? Okay, now another thing that's very relevant to our society is that this ship, which is going in the opposite direction. Let's say for the time being, let's assume we are talking about the public schools. Now in these public schools, they are not designed to make people good Muslims. They are not designed to ensure that we Muslims get the Imam of the world. They are not designed for that. They are designed on some other concepts, which we'll discuss shortly. So if our children go to these schools, what is the safety factor for them? The safety factor for them is the community effort, extensive community effort, and extensive effort by the parents. If parents become weak at any moment, the kids would certainly go on that ship in the opposite direction. And that has happened to a number of people in our society. Children have left Islam. Children, even according to our research, 25% of second, gen second generation of immigrants, they do not remain on Islam. Why? Because the parents are unable to cope up with their little boats. So we have to have a solid educational system which can protect our children. 
putting our children on these ships which are going in the opposite direction would never make them a good Muslim. Unless for some families it would be successful. Some families who are very powerful, whose, board, whose boards are really good, they've got really good understanding in the deen, the environment in their house is really good, they might survive. But if that environment is not there, and if they are not involved in the community effort to protect the children, then the situation is not very positive. We have to worry about it. We have to do something about it. All right, now let's discuss when we say that the systems, the educational system at the moment is based on a godless society, godless concept, godless system. Why do we mean, what do we mean by it? What is meant by it? Let's see. In order to understand that, we have to understand that whatever seed you put in into for the plant, the plant would be based on that. If you put apple seed, apples would grow out of it. If you put mango, mango would grow out of it. It would never happen that you the, the plant is grown out of an apple seed and it starts giving mango. It would never happen. We have to be careful about which seed is in the educational system that we send our children to. Let's see the difference between the godless and God-centered system. When we talk about the system A, which you can say the God-centered system, in that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator. So things relate to the creator. So we, we, in whatever we study, we know that there's a creator. We link it to the creator. Whereas in system B, it's a godless system. The things came into being by accident. Now, these are not just, this is not just a matter of Akida. There is a whole philosophy based on that. It can result in completely different consequences. In one, you are the Khalifa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on earth. You are sent with certain responsibility. In the other one, you are free what to do. If the whole society agrees that they have to do something bad, they would do something bad. No one is to stop them because they made their own laws. But in Islam, in the God-centered society, God-centered system, you are the Khalifa. You don't have your choice to change everything. In some things you have been given choice, but some things you have to follow according to the direction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are not free in that regard to do whatever you like. So that's the main difference. That would set the whole criteria of, of right and wrong. The whole system of morality would be based on that. So you can see they are very different seeds and they would give very different results. So we cannot expect that if we, um, if we send our children to a tree, which is, which is grown from a godless seed, that God-fearing attitude would be um, seen on them. So we have to be mindful of that. The third thing is that in the God-centered society, we believe that Adam salam, was the first human. So we are not animals. But in the godless society, we are evolved from animals. What it means is that we are animal too. Just like animals are not answerable for anything, we are not. We can do whatever pleases us. Whatever we enjoy, we should do. Whatever we think is right, we should do. But when we believe that we are not evolved, we are sent here for a purpose, there is a reason for us being here, we have got a completely different connotation of ourselves. Similarly, in the God-centered um, system, we believe that resources of this world are an amana. Similarly, the real life is the next one, not just, you know, not just this life. So it kills the materialism. Love for the wealth, love for the materialism. Wealth is a resource that we can use, but our life should not be centered around it. The completely different connotation of the system. And also the source of knowledge according to the God-centered society is the divine knowledge. The ultimate source is divine knowledge. But in the godless system, it's only based on our observation. Whatever does not come in our observation, we reject that. So that's the godless society. Completely different systems. If an educational system is based on godless system, then we cannot expect that our children would have God as the center of their life. It's not possible. So that is why it's very important to establish an educational system in which God is central. All right, now when we come to the modern institutions, or even um, some of the institutions which um, try to be religious, which consider them religious, 
what we are doing, the approach that Maulana Madhudi has highlighted is that there is a band aid work happening. Like on, on the old thing, something which is completely uncurable, we put, we are trying to treat it with certain band aids, bandages, and that's not going to work. Example of that you can see is that when the, all the curriculum is based on the godless system, in that we attach a patch of Islamic studies. What happens because of that? Children see that the culture in our institution does not support that thing which our Islamic studies teachers say. In science, we are told that we evolved from chimpanzees and he comes and says in one period that no, we are from Adam. So these things are contradictory. And then when he sees that the dominant aspect in the society is what he sees in the other classes, the culture promotes that everything is based on observation and so on. Then he gives into that thing. This promotes atheism. That is exactly what the problem in Aligarh University was pre-partition. It was made in the name of Islam. They made an Islamic university to promote Islam, but that was producing atheists. Why was it? Because with the system that was centered on godless principles, they were um, they just attached a patch of Islamic studies, and they were thinking that it would create God-fearing people. That never happened. So the same is the problem with many of our schools, with many of our institutions. What is the solution to that? We will see shortly. Also, the problem is one of the problems is that Islam has become an appendix. So Islam did not came to become an appendix to a, a book. It is the book. It cannot just be just an appendix in our life that we are engineer, doctor, and everything else first. And yeah, we are Muslim as well. So that appendix, yeah, just by the way, and we're not very happy and proud about it. If we say it or not, whether we say it or not, that's the situation of many of us. It just by the way, Muslim, we do whatever we want to do. We, our lifestyle is not very different from the lifestyle of the non-Muslims. It's just an appendix to our life. We are everything else first, Muslim later on. Now, in the Aligarh University, as I explained, there were three outcomes. Most of the people were become non-Muslim by heart. Some denounced the faith, became atheists. Some still said that, yeah, we are Muslim, but very upset about it, very apologetic about it. That was the majority of the students because the curriculum was not Islamized. And then there were a significant percentage which was undecided whether Islam is right or not, which, which are also called agnostics. Whether God exists or not, I don't know. And very few people saved. And these people were saved not because of the institution, but because of outside institution factors, because of the tarbira that they received from their parents and so on. But the casualty rate was very, very high. And same is the case with many of our other institutions. And, and I can take liberty to say that some of the Islamic schools might fall in this bucket as well. So we have to Islamize their curriculum if we want to keep our children Muslim. Otherwise, they would spend many years over there, but still from their heart, they wouldn't be Muslim. In their heart, they wouldn't have love for Islam. In their heart, they wouldn't have any urge to sacrifice their belongings for Islam. They wouldn't have any, any inclination towards that. And that would promote hypocrisy in the society. Also, another disease, another problem is that we have got incorrect yardsticks for measuring success. When it comes to measuring success for education, we use incorrect yardsticks. And akhlaq, the morality, does not even come in the equation. That is why we see that we are just like self, self flowering plants. We grow wherever we want, in whatever way, whatever direction, no uniform moral fabric of the nation. That's for our state at the moment. And also sometimes we use the same yardsticks for measuring success as they are used in the godless society, godless systems. So we have to change our yardsticks. If we do not measure our success based on the character we inculcate in children, if we don't measure our success based on the morality that we develop in the children, then we are not successful as a society, as institutions. So with this, we have completed our overview of the diseases that Malana Madhudi mentioned in this book. 
And now we are going to see some of the treatments that he has proposed. Main solution for us is to Islamize the knowledge. What is meant by Islamization of knowledge? We will see shortly. In order to enable that, we have to do a thorough planning. Molana has highlighted that with many of us, the problem is that we start something without thinking deeply about it, without reflecting about what we are going to achieve out of it. We just jump into action. And the result is that we are never successful in that effort. We might be successful if we measure it from the wrong yardstick, but if we measure it from the right yardsticks, then we are not successful many a time. So we have to do proactive planning, deep thinking, reflection before we jump into the action. The second thing is policy making, especially in Islamic countries. We have to get into the policy making positions. If we don't have any say in making policies, we won't be implement, able to implement any large scale cha change. We would just be implementing change in, in, in bite size pieces, bit size. But on the mass scale, the things would remain as it is. So we have to get into the policy making rules. So this is what we have to try to do. Now, also understanding what Islamization of curriculum is not. It is unfortunate we have seen that sometimes um, the same content, the same book, only some of the publishers, they just change the characters. If there was a character without the scarf and so on, they would put someone with a scarf. And with that, they would think that they have Islamized the curriculum. That's now the, how the curriculum is Islamized. The actual process of Islamizing the curriculum is what we see on the next slide. So before we go on to that slide that I mentioned, which I thought was the next slide, there are some important points about this knowledge. Islam has no problem with science. Islam is not against science. In fact, science is accumulation of facts and natural laws, which we very much accept in Islam because they are also the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there is something that we disagree about it. What we dis disagree about it are the frames with these facts and natural knowledge of natural laws in the godless system, there are certain principles on the base of which they formulate theories. For example, whatever subject you study nowadays, from psychology to neurology to other sciences, you would see that it is all based on evolution. Everything is based on evolution and it's all theory. When there are other alternate ways available to understand and explain a particular thing, they still tie themselves on evolution. And many of those things that they say, there's no evidence for that. It's just their thinking that it might have happened because of this and the fight and flight response might be because we used to fight with animals and we wanted to protect ourselves and so on. And our brain evolved that way. No evidence, just theorizing, just like the theories of the past, just like how Plato and, and others made the theories, which were completely wrong, incorrect theories. So same way, in the name of science, nowadays we are making theories because we are based on the system B, the godless system we are living in. So it means that we have to completely reinterpret these sciences from the God-centered perspective. Also, the positive aspects, uh, it, it, there are also some positive aspects of the Western system. So we can adopt them, we can use them because as we know that al-hikmah is dhalatul mu'min, that lost treasure of the Muslim. Wherever we find, we have to adopt it. So whatever is proven as good and is not based on the godless principles, we should adopt that. Let's see an example of looking at the same thing from the godless perspective and God-centered perspective. We all know that in winters, in some parts of the world, the water at the surface of the seas, it, um, um, it freezes. Now, when it freezes, what happens is that underneath it, the water doesn't freeze. It remains at four degrees centigrade. When we look at it from the perspective of godless system in which we think that the things have come up by their own, there's no creator, we would then look at it and say that it's because of the property of the water. That's why it happens. And that wouldn't make us uh, thank anyone that wouldn't create any gratitude in us, that wouldn't foster the love of Allah in us. 
Whereas if we know that these things are created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then what is the reason that we should not associate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If we look at it from the God-centered perspective, we would know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave these properties to the water. Because through this, he preserved the marine life. Had he not preserved that marine life, there would have been significant impacts on the planet, on the environment, on human beings. So it's out of great hikmah, great wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his great mercy that he did that. So with the God-centered perspective, this would be our thinking. So you can see completely different connotations, completely different outcomes. So now we see what is Islamization. So Islamization of education has got three facets. One is the Islamization of books and curriculum. The second one is Islamization of teachers. And the third one is Islamization of institutions. Let's see, let's unpack them. Islamization of books and curriculum comprises of removing the bifurcation between dini and dunyavi, worldly and religious sciences. So we have to remove that bifurcation. In Islam, everything, all walks of life are a part of deen. So we have to gain the guidance of deen in those sciences. Our books should reflect that. Just like how, the, how we saw the example of ice or the snow at the surface of the water reinterpreting and reconstructing the sciences from the Islamic perspective. History, you can study from Islamic perspective. The same things you would study, but you would look at it from a God-centered perspective. And the third thing is that redesign the curriculum with God at the center of it. So these are the three aspects through which we can Islamize the curriculum. So we have to reinterpret. And the theories that are based on the God-less system, we have to remove them and look at that and reinterpret those facts and natural phenomena from the God-centered perspective. This is the most important task that Maulana Madhubi has highlighted at several places in the book. Islamization of education, Islamization of curriculum, looking at it from the God-centered perspective. Otherwise, what would happen is that our children would see, if we don't do that, our children would see that in economics, there is no God. In politics, there's no God. In chemistry, there's no God. In biology, there's no God. Only in Islamic studies, there is a God and that does not relate to anything in my life. And that would be one of the very effective means to become an atheist. And that's what's happening with many of our children. So we have to do something about it as people interested in education, as people interested in protecting our children. There are some complementary solutions that Maulana has also highlighted that includes focus on akhlaq, and akhlaq should be part of the curriculum as well. Just like how we define that the children should learn multiplication, division, and this and that. In his proposal, he has also identified certain akhlaq, certain manners that should, that should be taught to them. That is a part of the curriculum. So that's what we have to work on. Training of teachers who can deliver this curricula. Now, I know of many incidences where even some Muslim teachers, they did not respond to the children of their question if it related to a slightly different thing from what they were teaching. Very hard boundaries of the subjects. And also, uh, sometimes they do not know how the thing that they are teaching relates to Islam. How does it link to God? How does it link to the history of Muslims? So we need those teachers, if you have to do something, who can work in that regard, who can deliver this Islamized education. Then you'll also need to offer the books that can be used for this purpose. So these are the things that are full projects in themselves. So we have to reinterpret, as you mentioned, to Islamize the curriculum. We have to reinterpret the, the, the sciences. So it, it's a whole job. We need a number of people working on these projects. Similarly, Maulana focused on um, the widespread understanding of Arabic language so that we can benefit from the sources directly. Promoting research, which is very much absent. So the Basar part, in the beginning of this talk, we discussed about Tama, Basar, and Fuad. So that Basar part, observing thing, research. So that's what he recommended in order to gain the Imam of the world. And establish center of excellence and benefit from knowledge of scholars from around the world. Alhamdulillah, our I can call it is a step in that direction where we can learn from scholars from all over the world. 
a number of best scholars, most profound scholars from around the world. Alhamdulillah, we are able to benefit from them in a systematic manner. Section four, some model institutions. And because of shortage of time, we won't spend too much time on that. We'll just quickly go through some of the things. One of the things is that the vision should be to obtain the imama of the world, to gain the leadership of the world. And in that regard, the objective is that Islam should become perspective of the students. They should look at the world from this perspective. Many of us have got these glasses as well, all of us. We often wear them when the debate is happening. We took out these glasses and wear them and it gave a very good speech on right and wrong. We give a very good speech. But once that discussion is over, we fold the glasses again and put in our pocket. When we take the decisions, then we don't wear these glasses. In many of the decisions in our life, we are not having this criteria of right and wrong on our eyes. So what we desire from our educational system is giving students a criteria of right and wrong so that they can make good choices in their life. Also, they should have proud in Islam, pride in Islam. They should love their faith. They should be proud of their history. This is what we want to achieve out of this educational system. If you are not pride, if you don't have pride in something, how would you and why would you work to spread it around the globe? Why would you think that this thing should be dominating in the world? Why this thing should be doing the imam of the world? If you yourself is, are not convinced that this is what is required. So very important to have pride in Islam. Third one is intellectual superiority. Our graduates, our students should be intellectually superior. Now, when we say we want imam of the world, the leadership, it means we have to be the best in class. In our thinking, we have to be the best in class. We have to be the thought leader. We should be the critical thinkers. We should be able to sift through things. We should be able to critically analyze things. And we should be morally superior. This is the thing where we are lacking the most at the moment. We are not morally superior at the moment. Walana has defined objectives of education at different levels, primary, secondary, and higher education in the book. And the beautiful thing that uh, I noticed in, in that is that he has divided the curricula in three aspects. One is akhlaqi aspects, certain um, attributes of ethics and morality at each level that after passing this level, the student should have these moral attributes like sacrifice, patience, steadfastness, hard work, and so on. At every level, he has designed, designed the moral attributes into the curriculum. Then the amali aspects, the practical aspects. For example, in primary, use of tool, use of technical drawing, use of various uh, equipments, and so on. Doing basic life skills, all these things are taught in primary. Also, it in includes a number of sports that what he has recommended horse riding and other aspects which we have which, have, which we are, which are also taught to us from sunna so he has included them in the curriculum also ilmi aspects nowadays what we see is that our curriculums are focused only on the ilmi aspects not on amali aspects and not on akhlaqi aspects so that's a fundamental change that you would see in this book Morana has considered these two also to be the most fundamental aspect of the curriculum akhlaqi Amali and Ilmi. So environment of the institution should be such that should promote uh, practicing Islam. There shouldn't be any hypocrisy. For example, in our schools, many a times you would have seen, um, I, I saw that in the childhood and also our teachers, Salman Asa Siddiqui Sahib shared about this. In school, you're writing a subject, the virtues of parents, how we should serve them. You're writing that. And your mother is sick at home. No teacher says that, better. why did you come to school today? You should have stayed with your mother. Had they done that, the kid would learn that what I'm saying really carries some practical uh, implication. At the moment, these are just words, these are just theories, which are away from practical. The children develops this mentality that it's okay to say something and not do it. We say that prayer is important, but we don't offer the prayer. It tells the children that it's okay to consider something as mandatory and still not do it. This is the mindset that they developed because of the environments and the situation and the education system that we put them in. And then there are other aspects we won't have time to cover today. I'll just quickly cover these section. section. 
how to start implementation so morana said that it would happen at a gradual pace it wouldn't happen overnight so he said that the first step is to prepare the teachers if you open up a school and you don't have teachers who can teach in a, a, according to the islamized curriculum then you would still be doing what all the other schools are doing so the first step is to prepare the teachers the second step is to formulate the books that you would be using the third step is to establish a model institution now it would be it wouldn't be right if we straight away jump to opening a school if we don't have the right teachers and the right curriculum to start with so those two steps have to be done and then we open up the school and then in that we do the trial and then expand after it's refined now we come to the last section and in the, this last section molana has explained some supplementary solution and there are four of them one of them is that till the time we have got that perfect educational system we should have an ad hoc curriculum for children alhamdulillah i can is trying to implement some of it through our initiative yamna young muslim network of australia out of school education and also for adults we should have a nisab a curriculum for them till that time we have got a system which can um, develop perfect uh, graduates so this is what we can do as a community professional associations are very important association of doctors association of engineers association of teachers and these associations can discuss with them how they can implement islam in their fields what is the guidance of islam for their field and implement that this shouldn't just be the social gathering that some doctors get together and they just socially um, interact and then go so they should be based on islamization of the education islamization of their profession and islamization of the society active msas are very important in universities you can question the un islamic ideologies in an intellectual manner you can create a culture an environment where it's easy to practice islam many of the students leave islam because they find it difficult that no one else is doing it so i leave it many people do it many people when they see the glitter of the world they they just go with the flow it's very important to strengthen them to give them the right culture the right environment in which they can practice islam and most importantly creating environment good environment at home children do not just learn at school they learn at homes as well they learn from the community members as well so we have to do uh, an effort that is spread on all the community now with this i'll conclude I'm, i apologize that i've gone over by 5 minutes to my planned time some of the things that we need to do is to write books to islamize the curriculum reinterpret the sciences especially the social sciences from the islamic perspective medical science what can we do to ensure that islam is practiced in that how can we teach it so that we have got good muslim doctors not just good doctors good muslim doctors how can we teach sociology so that we can teach the islamic values to that physics chemistry everything maths has to be why do we need to give examples about calculation of interest in math why can't we give questions about inheritance it can be in the science of inheritance of islam can be taught through mathematics it's all mathematics so these things we have to islamize so we have to have a team to work on that we have to have team to formulate the curriculum we have to have team to look at different professions and work towards islamizing them we have to have teams who have to work on uh improving the uh, our existing schools our existing colleges our existing universities we have to work on that sphere and there are a number of other projects that we have to work on as you would have seen through this presentation so with this inshallah i conclude i make a dua to allah subhanahu wa taala to make it beneficial for us and enable us to play our role in revolutionizing this field of education and islamizing it so with this inshallah we will go towards question and answer If you have got any question, you can unmute yourself, ask any question, discuss anything, or share any ideas. But before we go into that, I would like to highlight one thing: that one of our very dear sisters, she is uh, trying to establish an Islamic school in Perth, and she is looking for any people who who can dedicate it a period of time to this effort, time, energy, and thought. So, if you are interested, you can uh, contact her. um and or you can contact myself and inshallah i'll connect you to her and inshallah then uh, we can start that project inshallah let's see what uh, questions we have got i'm just reading the comments inshallah the 
if there are any questions, you can also unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, brother, I can hear you. Uh, my name is, <clears throat> sorry, my name is Zainul Abedi. Yes, I'm calling you from South Africa. Uh, Jazakallah for this very inspiring talk and very informative and insightful. Uh, my concern is that, you know, what, what you're talking about has been sort of been in the making for many, many years, the Islamization of knowledge through organizations like Triple IT and many others. And there are lots of like Islamic schools that have been established since the 1980s. Uh, there's also a very recent uh, global, uh, global Association of Islamic Schools that have been established, uh, you know, with an initiative actually from South Africa. So, what I'm saying is that, uh, you know, the, the, all the ideas that you've actually put, put forward are excellent. But what I'm trying to find out is, has all this work not been done already? The curriculum, the uh, teacher training manuals and all of that, is, is, it, is it not, uh, I mean, it's never too late to do this, but are we not reinventing the wheel? Has this not been done already? I mean, organizations like in America, like Ikra Foundation, they've also produced a lot of like materials. A lot of parents have been concerned about, uh, uh, you know, the issues about uh, Islamic education and Islamization and all of that, and giving our children uh, a good uh, muttaki leadership values in that sense. So I'm I'm just asking, um, you know, like your your concluding part said that uh, we need to do these things, but have this, these not yet been done? And if they have been done, which I think, I think a lot has been done, can we not sort of have a forum or some place where all these resources could be put together and made, make it accessible to people who are interested in, um, you know, in, 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 in the real thought processes and the ideals that we have about sure. developing leadership and so forth. Yeah. It's a good question. Brother. Thank you. Yeah. So just a couple of comments on that. So one thing is that definitely we need to share resources. We have established a platform um, on WhatsApp at the moment, a group of um, educationalists who uh, are who we have uh, assembled the group in order to share ideas, share the experiences and so on. So it's highly encouraged that we should all do that. Having said that, I have studied some Islamic schools and, and some other schools in Muslim majority countries as well as Muslim minority countries and some curriculums. Um, and at the moment, I do not personally think that we are there yet. So the education, the, the good books have been produced, but as I mentioned many a times, they are not um, Islamized fully. Many a times, it's just the change of the characters and so on. But inculcating and, and interpreting everything with a God-centered approach in many of the books and many of the curriculums, I don't find. Also, we have to keep in mind that at the moment, we are not just talking about schools. We are talking about the broader educational system, especially when you go to the universities, especially in the universities, there's almost nothing except some Islamic universities. But again, a lot is required, still required to be done over there. So I agree there are some things which are available, but much of what I have studied, it's still significantly lacking. So, but in some professions, in some professions, there is some good work, like in Islamic finance and economics, there's some good work. In medical practice, also some good work is done, but a number of other fields are still vacant in which more is required to be done. In terms of curriculum as well, I personally see some gap in that regard as well. So, so, so just as a matter of follow-up, um, would after this meeting, would there be some way in which uh, some kind of a committee is set up or some kind of an organization that will actually drive this process to, to, to develop these materials, find all the resources, financial and otherwise, uh, worldwide? Because yeah. there's lots of people worldwide that are keen on this whole project 
I think, uh, but there must be some champions that will drive this process, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah. So I have sent my email address in the chat box. So if any interested brothers and sisters could contact me, inshallah, we'll add them to the group that we have formed. And the aim is that we'll identify certain projects from that group, we will share resources in that group, and that way, inshallah, we'll all learn from each other. Jazakallah. Jazakallah. Any, any other questions or thoughts? Uh, Nabil, we want one question. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I, I was thinking about uh, uh, specifically the, the, the works of Maulana Mududi that uh, because I'm aware that in addition to his writing and, you know, all the academic work he did, he took the practical steps and then he established one kind of, you know, uh, a jama and then, then similar work was done um, in other parts of the world as well, like uh, by Sayyid Qutub and uh, likes of him. So, so uh, I mean, in your opinion, what, what happened actually, what, what went wrong that uh, we don't see that kind of progress that, we, we do not even see one one model, you know, uh, institution or one model model setup that, and uh, I mean, there was, yes, we can see that uh, uh, they were able to put a stop to some kind of, uh, you know, developments that were happening, like uh, towards the, the, the godless societies, but even, uh, you know, living in the uh, kind of Muslim uh, societies and Muslim country, they were not able to, you know, progress to that uh, uh, extent and, uh, and and I mean what what we can learn from uh, them and then because I think uh, if they were not able to do it there in in the countries like Pakistan and Egypt how how will be able to do it in the countries where I mean the, the system is not uh, even that accepting so that's, that's what I was thinking. Malana explained one thing in the book and that is that this revolution would not happen in a short period of time he said that it would maybe happen in a few generations. Maybe if you train 50 such people that we want, the type of the people that we want, then their offspring, and then further on in maybe third generation, you would see the impacts of it. So that's one thing that the process is slow. The second thing is that if we have got the leadership of a particular area, then these things are easy to implement. But if everything is opposing you, everything is going in the wrong direction, then sometimes it's not that easy. So that factor also has to be kept in consideration. The third thing is that sometimes it happens that the intellectual maturity of uh, some of the people is not matched with the intellectual maturity of the others. So others sometimes are unable to carry the idea in this, with the same spirit, with the same force, with the same priority as the, the person who proposed the idea. So that can be a factor in some of the other places as well. Having said that, in my opinion, none of that should stop us because we are responsible for our effort and we are answerable for our efforts. So we are answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that these things are happening in your society and your community. What did you do? So what we need to do is to deeply ponder upon what should be the, about what should be the right approach and then follow that right approach. If we are correct in that right approach, we would get reward. If we are wrong in that uh, right in, in that approach, but our intention was right, we'll still get the reward. So this this should be our mindset. And if there's any other better uh, approach than this, we should follow that. And I think what what is required from us is the energy and motivation to do it. And with that, inshallah, we can make a difference. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, just just to follow up again, that I mean, uh, my point was not to to be, uh, you know, uh, disappointed anyone or being, you know, uh, hopeless. Obviously, uh, that's, that's not the point. And I, I just wanted to uh, ask that whether uh, we can we can learn because um, obviously um, it, it has been like a, a couple of decades uh, uh, since Mola uh, Ramodbi established the Jamaat. And, and then if we can learn something that considering uh, of, of the situation, what what actually went wrong and uh, whether we can improve on it or not. But uh, I, I, I got that. Yeah, I think the situation is not bad um, as well. Uh, there are a number of institutions that have been established by his Jama'a. Also uh, universities, um, some of the universities are based on his model now. Like when these Islamic mm -hmm. universities were being formed around the globe, it was he who gave the proposal for them and, and a number of his proposals are included in the formulation of Islamic University of Medina 
and also he received the king um, king fahd uh, award for that and so on and also in inter other international islamic universities so after one of the conferences in makkah these islamic universities were open around the globe also in pakistan there were a number of schools a number of large number of schools that are uh, trying to implement this effort and it's a learning curve they would learn from that sometimes they would need people to go to them and guide them because sometimes when you're in the thing you're unable to see um, the impacts and the relationship and so on so maybe someone needs to take a step and guide them as well that this is not as per the model of Maulana Madhudi we can raise our voice for example in his book he has given a proper model of how to make scholars and ulama and even that model is not implemented in Pakistan whereas one um, one of the Vifakul Madaris is, is run by his Jama'a. So we can go to them, we can um, show that we are not happy with that. We can, and then we can request them to change it, to implement it according to what he proposed, which we believe is, is something that is really useful, but it, it needs to be implemented. So we have to go into the decision making position. So it, the work in the Jama'a happens with consultation. So we have to uh, involve ourselves and get get into a position where we can give suggestions and receive suggestions and then help help them in improving those things as well. Right. Exactly. One last uh, Assalamu alaikum. Yes, brother. Uh, brother Nabil Jawad here. Uh, can we do a little comment or is this just a question and answer session? Feel free. Yeah. Feel free. yeah, okay, brother. So um, I just wanted to like kind of comment on one of the things and that is that, um, you know, we often talk about the education system of the madrasas, right? Mm -hmm. I have a little feeling that I think we talk, we put more emphasis on changing the, uh, the way or the curriculum of the madrasas than we should be like talking about it. Because if you see, um, I think personally, they have been performing pretty well. Like, because if you consider, obviously, if you consider from that point of view that they are teaching um, um, uh, religious stuff, like if you take that as a subject, I mean, how they go are going to be part of the society or this or that, that's a different story. But um, as a religion, as something that's applicable, I think they have been doing a pretty good job. Now, the style of how we they should be teaching might be slightly different, but adding, you know, how sometimes there's this perception that, oh, why aren't they doing, studying all these mathematics and physics and this and that. I personally uh, think that it wouldn't be possible because if you want to master religious sciences, you can just master that. You can't be a master of physics and religious sciences and mathematics and, every, and everything else as well. So that's why I just wanted to add a little. So even though, I, I mean, I still agree there should be a bit of a change, but maybe 10 or 20%. Whereas on the other side, where the emphasis is less, like normally very few people talk on changing the other system, like, you know, our public schools and our universities and everything where there needs to be an 80% change. No one talks about that. But whereas I personally think there should be like a 10 to 20% change in the madrasas and everyone's talking about them. So yeah, I just wanted to highlight a little bit. Uh, inshallah, we will do a full session on that. And the thing about changing the Madrasa curriculum is it has come from scholars, in fact. And I would mm -hmm. recommend a very good book. It's called Muhazrat e Talim by Dr. Mahmoud Mazghadi, who himself was a Madrasa graduate, Madrasa teacher for a very long time. And he mm -hmm. a number of scholars and highlighted that. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons why we talk about reform. Some you want to go also? Yeah, I think you want to go is that we need to plaza the thing is that we need to um, be able to solve the problem of the present era for example there are very few scholars about these modern concepts when we go and ask them fatwa what is the job of the scholars to give fatwa so when we go to them if they don't know that thing well then they would they can give an incorrect fatwa so, so at least we are not saying that they should become expert in maths or physics and that's no one is saying that what would he say is that they should be able to solve the, the problems that, that come to them. So we need to broaden their thinking when it comes to sociology and so on. But it's a very detailed thing, inshallah, we'll have a chat about it sometime. I Just to let you know that I have very closely studied um, the madrasa curriculum and did a thesis on them and so on. And went to a number of madaris, studied very closely with them. 
and have compiled some observations. So inshallah, we'll discuss them sometime, inshallah. Inshallah, thanks, brother. Inshallah. And, and also we tried to cover um, the, I think our discussion was more about changing the other side of the thing today. So inshallah with this, we will conclude because the time of prayer, Isha prayer is also coming very near. So we hope that um, the attendees found this session beneficial. I really thank them for joining and I make dua to Allah to make it beneficial for all of us. Assalamu alaikum.